Good evening, everyone. A very warm good evening to each one of us who is joining for today's SIP chat. The guest on today's SIP chat is a name which doesn't need any introduction, at least in the area of whole of WCPT region of East Asia Pacific region. Professor Gillian Webb, she has graduated as a physiotherapist, qualified as a physiotherapist way back in 1965, the year why I was not even born. So it's a privilege to talk to a legendary physiotherapist who have a deep connection with India, rose to the level of heading the region of WCPT, AWP region as a deputy head and also as a head. Currently sitting on the executive committee of AWP, very active in physiotherapy education, developing physiotherapy in many underdeveloped countries like Nepal, Maldives, Mauritius and so on. A name which is very familiar with Society of Indian Physiotherapists being honored numerous times with professional organization as well as the government. With these words, please join me to welcome our today's guest, none other than Professor Gillian Webb. Good evening, everybody. It's lovely to see to be here. Good evening, Gillian. Thank you so very much for joining us today sharing your journey and experience. And I must acknowledge from a chilly winter at Delhi, temperature about five degree to a city in Melbourne, which must be about 40 degree as of now. Yeah, about 38 now. We've just dropped a little bit. <laughs> Great. And yeah. I must thank you for accepting our invitation to join us. And I'm sure it's almost the midnight at Melbourne at this stage. Yes, it's 10.30 or just after 10.30. Lovely. So I'm grateful to you. I thank you on behalf of all our member and our physiotherapy colleague who is watching this chat and also people who are going to refer it later when it's available on YouTube. So thank you once again, Gillian, for taking your time out in these odd hours and joining us and sharing your journey and experience as a physiotherapist. So Gillian, we all are quite excited. I mean, we, I was personally very delighted and surprised when I heard about this, your Indian connection way back about 10, 11 years ago. So would you like to tell us more about what is this Indian connection and how did it all happen? Yeah. Yes, well, uh, I was born in India. I was born in Uttar Pradesh at the city of Azamgarh. Uh, and my three older brothers were also all born in India. My parents went to India in the mid-1930s. That's a long time ago. Uh, they were missionaries and uh, they were at the Church of North India. So we were around Faisabad and Azamgarh, uh, Lucknow, that sort of area. And then, so I have three older brothers. They were all uh, born in India as well. My eldest brother and myself were born down on the plains in India at Azamgarh. 
and my two middle brothers were born at Landau because we would go up to the foothills of the uh, Himalaya when uh, it was hot in the summertime. So they were born at Landau. My three older brothers went to Woodstock to school and were boarders there. Uh, I was a bit too young, so uh, I would go up with my parents to Landau and then I would go to kindergarten, which was sort of just down, uh, well, just above Woodstock school. So um, India is my heart and my soul and uh, I have, uh, my family has kept a long and constant contact with India. Um, I think that all of my brothers and myself, if we see anyone walking down the street who looks as if they come from the subcontinent, we greet them, expecting that they've come from India. Quite a lot of the time they've lived in Australia all their lives, but that's all right. Uh, so we have a very deep commitment and a very deep love of India. So I suppose that has been part of what has driven me to the sort of work that I've done um, in the Asia Pacific region. Yeah. Great to learn that, Jillian. I mean, it's 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 kind of a, you know uh, pairing your story, your connection with India, and now I can say that very proudly. You have continuing your connection in yeah. a better and an efficient way. I mean, you have been visiting India as frequently, India, Nepal. I think any none of the uh, world leader have done it in the field of physiotherapy. But I must also share here is uh, you were born in India, so wish you could continue to stay and work as a therapist in India so that we had a better leadership in our association at this stage. <laughs> I, would to, at this I would stage. love to do that, but I'm not sure that my husband would do that. Uh, he <laughs> He's still working, so he he would find that a bit hard. But I would I would love to be able to do that. Um, as I say, I have a deep passion for India and mm, some of the other countries around. And the just acknowledge whether you were not practicing or working for Indian associations, but I think your support always was with Indian and always will remain for Indian yeah. therapists. And we are really grateful and thankful for you for that. And I'm sure the loss of India was actually the gain for Australia and the whole region. So we are proud to be associated with you, Gillian. Uh, Gillian, now tell me about you qualified in 1965 as a physiotherapist. Yes, that's and, right. Uh, so how did that happen? I mean, how did you choose and why did you choose physiotherapy as a profession? Well, it's very funny you should ask because I didn't know what I really wanted to do and I thought I might do medicine. And I was always, I always loved sport and I was good at sport. And uh, some of people, my parents, friends, and said, why don't you think of physiotherapy? And I said, well, what is physiotherapy? Um, and when I found out what physiotherapy was, I thought, oh, that sounds a bit more interesting than um, doing medicine. First of all, it was only a three-year program compared to a six-year program. So I thought that's pretty good. I don't have to study so long. Anyway, I started that and I must say that it was the best choice I've ever made in my life, uh, other than my husband. I better be careful what I say. <laughs> but but was... We must be asleep by time now. It's 10.30, so you can be fair. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but uh, uh, look, it, it was um, at that stage, it was a diploma of physiotherapy in Australia. And uh, in the uh, 1970s, it moved to degree programs. I didn't actually upgrade my physio program. Instead, I did a postgraduate diploma in exercise for rehabilitation. Then I did a master's in clinical education and then I did a doctorate in education. So I moved along that pathway, which um, enabled me to be continuing to be a physiotherapist. And uh, uh, as I say, for 50 odd years now, it's been the most fantastic thing in my life, yeah. And there's so much of work which is credit to you which because of you so many physiotherapists like us who are able to practice independently and with great dignity and thanks to you for your work in these such countries so um, Gillian also tell me that I know you established you were instrumental in establishing one of the most prestigious physiotherapy program at University of Melbourne so mm -hmm. can you please share something about how did it all started establishing a new school in 1991, along with, I think, there were only a few colleagues, two maybe with you, who yes, started, came probably. along with you, and then you rose to the level of deputy head and the head. So can you please share your journey, how this all happened? Well, it was an interesting journey because um, the School of Physiotherapy at that stage was at a place called Lincoln Institute. So it wasn't attached to a university. 
many long years before that, it had been attached to the University of Melbourne, a lot of the educational programs. When I did my program, we did all our anatomy, physical education, physiology, psychology at the University of Melbourne. But um, there was a change in how education was done in Australia in the 1970s, and they amalgamated um, the colleges of advanced education where physio was. And they wanted it to go to the, um, a new university called La Trobe University. Well, there were those of us in the profession who didn't think that was the right place for physiotherapy because they didn't have any biomedical sciences or medical sciences at that stage. We had a long protracted um, debate with the government um, to not send us to La Trobe University, but for us to continue with the University of Melbourne. It was um, a very difficult debate and discussion. And eventually after about four years of, um, yeah, pretty tough times, uh, we were given permission to start a second school of physiotherapy at the University of Melbourne. And so Professor Joan McMeekin and Dr. Elizabeth Tully and myself, um, we were uh, asked to set up the program there. So. It had been um, quite a push from the professional association as well for us to move back, if you like, fully at the University of Melbourne. So we established a four year bachelor's program there. And then about eight years ago, no, nine years ago, we established a, um, a DPT, a doctor of physiotherapy program. So um, it's been, it was a wonderful journey. It was uh, a lot of work when I had four youngish kids to be looking after and schooling as well. And it kept me pretty busy. And uh, at the same time, I did my studies for my doctorate as well. So yeah, it was busy times, but um, that was good for my sons to learn that mum wasn't always there. I can imagine how exciting it must be wearing and how difficult also it must be wearing so many hats. Yeah. being a mother, being a student, being set, setting up something. Mm. So, uh, Jillian, you have been very instrumental in developing physiotherapy in many developing countries. You have playing active role in many of them still now. So yeah. please tell me how this that all happened. Where did you get all these motivation from and how your experience have been in these countries? Mm. Well, I suppose, first of all, because of my background of having been born in India and uh, when we were growing up, we always had people living with us for 12 months, 18 months from many countries in the region, from India, from Fiji, from Tonga. We had a family of a mother and four daughters from Germany live with us for 18 months. So we always had people living with us from other countries. Um, my parents um, were amazing people and very committed people, I suppose. And uh, so in some ways, I think it was just natural that it, that's what happened to me. And then uh, I met up with Mary Martin from Canada, who had helped develop physiotherapy in Nepal, particularly. Uh, she'd set up the diploma program there and then the School of Physio and also helped set up the association. And I said to her, oh, look, I might come along and help a little bit with it and see if you like. And uh, from there, you know, I've been able to do a lot more and then through the professional association uh, and then through obviously through AWP and WCPT as it was then. Um, everything just seemed to happen, I suppose. And I uh, have had the most wonderful time with meeting and making friendships and colleagues all throughout this whole region. It's been fantastic. Can you share some of your experience, what you must have come across while developing physiotherapy in this country? I know, uh, especially our colleagues from Nepal, they treat you like a mother. They say you are a motherly figure for them to you know, develop physiotherapy and they give a lot of credit to you for their recognition within their own country, developing a formal program and also internationally. You have been very supportive in developing the National Association in Nepal. Would you like to share some experience in that regard? Well, I suppose Nepal and Indonesia, both of them are very interesting countries where um, I have to say that the young physiotherapists that I've worked with over the last well, 15 years, I suppose now in Nepal, are just amazing young people. They were so keen to move forward, um, keen to develop up their bachelor's program from a diploma, 
Um, and I suppose what I was able to do was to give some guidance and how people had done things in other countries. I could share the program that we had done at the University of Melbourne. It didn't mean that you have to take that whole program, but you could take the framework and develop your program around it. And then I was privileged to be able to sit on quite a few of their committees from NEPTA to set up things like ethics and registration and regulation and things. And I suppose sometimes it's easier for someone who has some titles and things to come in from outside and be able to say things to government that the local people can't say quite so easily or to the university people. We've had amusing times at the university where I've said to them, if you want to be excellent, you can't do it like that. And they said, but we have to, you know, and I say, well, you can't be excellent then. So we would have these discussions and debates that would end up in, la in laughter because of having to negotiate what we could do or not do to change things. And I've just enjoyed mentoring um, these young academics. Uh, we now have about four or five of the staff who have been doing their PhDs. Um, three have completed or four, three or four have completed their PhDs. I mean, it's so wonderfully exciting to see um, the development of young people who take leadership roles and are keen to listen and then um, listen to ideas from other places but adapt it to their culture and their needs. So I've been extraordinarily lucky um, with being able to, if you like, help and guide along the way and to make wonderful friendships. And Indonesia has been much the same. I've been going there for about 20 years in Indonesia, um, a couple of years ago, when I was there for the conference, the president, Ali Imran, said to me, now, Prof Jill, there's two things you've got to do before you come back next year for our conference. And I said, oh, right here. One, you've got to learn Bahasa, right here, that's the language. And the other thing is that you've got to learn some new dance moves. <laughs> so I had to learn some new moves for dancing. So, but again, they were moving from diplomas to degrees or diploma three-year diplomas to four-year diplomas and they had a government and government regulations that were very hard uh, as many of the countries have um, to get change and physiotherapy didn't have a loud voice uh, in government circles whereas the medical profession has very loud voices and if physio raised their voice the medical profession quite often got a bit upset about that and in Indonesia, I used to laugh a little bit, you know, we'd take three steps forward, two steps back, three steps forward, but they've moved on as well, fantastically well, and they've got degree programs going now and members of their staff and things who are um, uh, got PhDs as well. And they're working hard towards independent practice. It's still uh, it's still an issue for them, as it is in many countries, because the medical profession, again, keep thinking they have to hold on to the apron strings and to make sure we don't take their jobs from them, I suppose. Um, and so, you know, as I say, coming in from outside, if you like, with a background like I have in education and in professional associations, I can speak up a little bit more loudly and a little bit more strongly than perhaps the local people can with government officials and things. Um, and I'm very lucky to be able to do those sorts of things. I, I just, uh, I can't think how lucky I have been with my professional life. It has just been fantastic. And people say to me, Jill, why do you keep traveling now? Why do you keep going to these places? And I said, well, this is my passion. This is my absolute passion. And I don't have to go to meetings any longer. So I'm very lucky. <laughs> no, glad that. And as you said that you have been lucky, but I must also say the profession also has been lucky to have a professional like you who has mm. been serving tirelessly and continue to do that. And coming back to your Indonesia, Indonesian president request, I'm sure we did help you to learn some new move, if not learning the Basa. <laughs> That <laughs> must have, you know, uh, helped you to learn some move. If not, then we'll ensure that we 
do that in the next conference for you. My, my fingers and joints don't quite move like you people in India or the people in Indonesia and the and the lovely uh, young people in Nepal when I go up there every year try to teach me to move my body in their ways as well and I'm not very good at it I have to say but I do love dancing. <laughs> sure, the three countries India, Nepal and Indonesia share a lot of lot of common things historically so Ooh, I think yeah. there are a lot yeah. of common factors which are binding us together and you being one of them actually oh, we're keeping okay. at least physiotherapists from india nepal and indonesia together okay uh, jillian uh, you have worked you have seen the change do you really see some uh, change now in physiotherapy clinical practice as of now as compared to earlier days and what's that exactly well, I think physio practice is changing all the time. Um, as we get more evidence, practice in Australia is changing. Um, and I think that the practice in the countries in the region uh, is changing. There is not as much emphasis, if you like, on electrotherapy just for the sake of electrotherapy. It's got its place. But there's not just that's all that the, the public think about is physiotherapy is electrotherapy. Uh, there's a lot more emphasis now in all of the countries, I think, about physical activity, uh, movement, exercise. We know the evidence strongly for those things. And yet we mustn't lose our skills in hands-on as well. So I have seen a change. There's been a big change in my own country. And I see that going into many different countries, how we manage things like chronic pain, um, in the past, we do a lot of hands-on things and a lot of manips and all these sorts of things. And now it's much more about teamwork, the language we use, empowering people to live with pain, if you like, but manage their pain. So I think that practice is changing. And the good thing in the region is everybody is much more familiar with the evidence and look for evidence. Um, there's still practice here in Australia and practice in many of the countries in the region that's not fantastic. But I always argue that if we get excellence in education, then we'll have excellence in practice. And if we want to be independent practitioners, we have to have excellence in education because that will give us excellence in practice. And then people will say, oh, I'm just going to go and see the physiotherapist because they are so good, they help, they get good outcomes. I, I have to look after myself. I learn how to do, to manage my body better, things like that. So I'm a great believer that education and practice are tied together. And it's not just undergraduate education, it's continuing professional development, it's going on and doing masters in specialist areas and things, it's going on and doing the research. And SIPCOM's been fantastic at that to have the young people who are presenting the research they're doing in their masters and PhDs. And to me, that's the important thing that people are listening and thinking about, well, I used to do it this way, but mm, the, you know, I just did it because somebody else did it that way. So I thought I'd just copy them instead of thinking, what does this person need? What's the relationship here? How can we work together to get a better health outcome? Mm. So delighted and so basic and I think, but so right and so true in that sense that all these things are correlated. If yeah. education is at best, clinical will automatically. And if yeah. we need to reach there, we need to ensure that our clinicians are well. So yeah. absolutely, I can't agree more than this. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jillian, let me take you to the international arena. Now, you have been very active with WCPT, which is now known as World Physiotherapy, and you that's still right. continue to be. Yes, that's right. You have been the chair of Asia West Pacific region. Yeah. How yeah. was the experience dealing with 30 odd countries as a chair? Oh, look, that was just fantastic. And um, each country is different, but we're all the same. And I think you can tell physiotherapists, you can walk down the street and you think, ah, they're a physiotherapist. There's something in the way we walk, or I don't know what it is, but I quite often will say to somebody, are you a physiotherapist? Oh, yes, I am. How did you know? And there's something about physiotherapists. And I think that um, no matter which country I'm in, whether it's in Fiji when I go there, or Bangladesh when I went there, or when I went to Afghanistan, 
it's the same. It's people wanting to serve their communities. It's people wanting to get better health outcomes, um, knowing that in many of the countries, they're not going to get great financial returns from it, but it is about that service to the community and the terrific interactions that we have with our patients. Um, I think of some of the longer term rehab in the spinal cord rehab in Bangladesh, going to their magnificent spinal cord rehab hospital there, the relationships that physios develop with the patients and their families over a longer period of time or with children with disabilities and things. I think we're very privileged and very lucky. And in each of the countries, even though there might be some differences about how you work with the government or whatever it is, physiotherapists, we all speak the same language. Um, and it's very easy to walk into a physiotherapy school or into a physiotherapy department and immediately connect with each other because worldwide, that's what we do. It's, just, it, it's so much part of it, yeah. So my time as chair and now on the executive, and of course I was deputy chair to Savita when she was the chair of the region, so that was nice. Um, and that's been a wonderful friendship with her. And of course Ginny was on the, on the uh, executive of WCPT as well. So it's been a wonderfully long connection with India via uh, WCPT and AWP. Very, and I must say that a very rare occasion where we had three brilliant ladies born in India leading the physiotherapy at the international front. Yeah, yeah, you, but, Samita, Dr. Ginny and everybody. So I think yeah. it was a great combination. Please continue. Yeah, no. So I think that, um, as I say, there are differences in countries, obviously. There are cultural differences. There are differences in ways people live and the way they go about their lives. Um, exercise in many of the Asia West Pacific countries has not been a thing that a lot of people think they have to do because it's hot and they don't want to exercise. Uh, it has to be a change of thought processes and things. Um, but as I say, in the end, um, and especially now with all the access that we have through internet and connections and Zooms like this and everything, um, I think that the sharing of knowledge and the sharing of collegiality is fantastic. And if I take for an example, during the uh, COVID pandemic that we're under now, um, uh, Xu Fen, who's the chair of AWP at the moment, set up a, uh, a messenger uh, group. And that's been fantastic. We've talked all about what's happening about COVID in each country, people report in, and then there's been lots of things from World Physio or different uh, countries, um, you know, that people can go and listen to about how to work with COVID or not. And it's been a fantastic bringing together, if you like, of the region. So I think that, um, as I say, we speak the same language with each other and we, we basically, communicate and understand what it is to be a physiotherapist. Great. And I think the technology has bring all of us much closer, actually. Yeah, so again, much more easier. easy yeah. for us to communicate and more meaningful yeah. and effective. Yeah. Great. Um, Gillian, moving ahead, AWP being the uh, largest region within bird physiotherapy, I believe. Yes, it and is. Yes. Within that AWP region, the, the two biggest country, China and India, at one time of prime, they were not represented. So how the rest of the world reacted to it? There was a good amount of years where, I think China is still not part of world physiotherapy, correct no. me if I'm wrong, but there was a time when both the biggest country of the world were not. So how the world reacted to it? Well, I think from world physiotherapy or WCPT as it was then, we're, we're very disappointed that India wasn't for a while. China's been an interesting one and, um, uh, Professor Alice Jones, who's a physio here in Australia, but comes from Hong Kong originally, uh, has been doing an awful lot of work, uh, as did Margot Skinner from uh, WCPT or World Physio now, um, in working with the people in China. And they've developed quite a few uh, good schools of physiotherapy now and are expanding because up until, well, 10, 15 years ago, there weren't schools of physiotherapy. They were mainly orthopedic surgeons who had trained up some nurses and things like that. Um, but there are, you know, 
It's a big country. It's not an easy one, perhaps. There's a fair bit of bureaucracy that still has to be sorted through. And uh, I know they're very keen to become part of um, w, uh, world physiotherapy, uh, but it's still that negotiation through um, government bodies and things that it is being worked on. And that'll make a huge difference in the region once, uh, because that is a huge country. And of course, with the Indian Physiotherapy Asso Association of Physiotherapists, well, it was very sad to lose them for a number of years um, while they sorted out their problems. Um, and I'm glad to hear that they're back on board because we need them in the region, we need them in the world, and India needs the world with them as well. So, you know, it's a two way benefit for everybody that um, India is back on board. And I just hope that. Um, the IAP is able to move forward and move forward well together and be a united body. And I'm sure that SIP can, SIP can help develop that, if you like, and be uh, because the people at SIP are all senior physios and had a lot of experience and are very much into education and research and practice and I think can be good advisors for IAP and things as well. And all of the committee of um, SIP have been past presidents or whatever of IAP as well. So I look forward to IAP being stronger and stronger and participating one in the region, but also in the world physiotherapy. Absolutely. Yeah, we, 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 yeah. we are also very keen to support and very happy to have the yeah. Indian flag back and through IAP. Absolutely. All of our founder members have been associated very deeply right. with that. And we would exactly. do everything possible to make it more stronger exactly. in time to come. Now, since we're talking about it, and I must share with that, there are a few people around who are spreading this rumors, or I would say blunt lies, that SIP applied for membership of WCPT and those era. And you being the chair must have come across our application, Gillian. Well, I haven't seen it in my papers anywhere. In the oh, no, it wasn't in my papers. I think there, there was discussions about could India be represented at different meetings and things and perhaps SIP could represent them, um, be sitting in or whatever it was, but there was never an application from SIP to um, the then WCPT, now w, uh, World Physiotherapy. We were always very keen to have observers or someone from India still being engaged and certainly Ali Irani was, came to a number of the meetings and sat in as an observer while um, the IAP was sorting itself out. But no, there's not to my knowledge was there any application by SIP. Um, as I say, it was much more a discussion about representation if there could be, if there needed to be representation from India. Can we help in that way? till IAP gets themselves sorted out. So I think you being the chair of AWP region, I being the secretary, I think none of us have come across those paper, but yeah. still those people who have audacity to spread this lies, I don't know with their vested interest, what the reason behind, but anyways, God help them. And uh, there were few people because of whom, because of their action or pretend uh, India lost its membership in WCPT. Yeah. Yeah. And as you rightly said that the intention was India should be represented. Yeah. Till the time there is no proper member. And thanks for clarifying that. I think it will set the record straight and yeah. we will yeah. get to, you know, know what exactly happened that time and how this all happened. Yeah. Let's come back to your journey. I know personally that you have been very instrumental in guiding, apart from setting up practice, clinical setting and education, you have been very instrumental in establishing a professional association. Our colleagues in Nepal talks about it so frequently that you are the one who gave that guidelines, hold them hand together, organizing conferences, you know, making it shape to a real professional body. Can I request you if we can share some of your learning out of or some of your experience out of establishing an association there? Well, uh, associations, as you know, are quite difficult bodies. And uh, as we found in, in India, and in Nepal, there were issues about, you know, those who had bachelor's degrees and those who had master's degrees and all, oh, they should be a different association and they should be this and they should be that. Well, the Australian Physio Association is a very strong association, but we've grown over time. And I've been fortunate to be involved with the Associate Physio Association for, you know, a long time and seen how they've worked. I've sat on senior committees and things. 
And so that gave me, if you like, some knowledge and skills about governance and how, how best to go about working with governments, how to set yourselves up. It's never easy um, because it's always voluntary work by people. Um, and then another group of people come in and things change and things. But to get things established around things like, well, how will you do your voting in an association? How's that going to be done? How's it going to be done well? So that not like in the USA in their last election, that people will believe that the election was right and proper and things. And we look at IAP around issues of that. And how do you set up the rules and regulations and how do you get people to work to rules and regulations? So there, I think some of the, the complex things. And then I've been able to share and the Australian Physio Association in New Zealand have been keen for us to share standards of practice, standards for education, um, because it's the same standards worldwide. You just have to put some cultural differences and things in. And so, you know, that I've been able to help do that and be able to share things like ethics. So I did spend a couple of days uh, in Nepal one time where we sat down and talked about setting up a new school of physiotherapy and they've just started a couple. Well, I, the, the minutiae we had to get into was very different to what we do in Australia. You know, you have to have these number of buses to take students here or you have to have this square meters. There was very much control about everything in it. And, but that's great because that's how that country works. So how do we get that set up? And then how do you use that to help another school of physiotherapy start? And they've done that very well by sharing curriculum, making sure that they've got strength. It's not easy again, because in most of the countries in the region, our medical colleagues make it difficult for us. Um, and you've got to get what I say to people always is, find those medical colleagues who know that they have good physios working with them and then get them and use them to assist you. So if you're setting up regulation and things, get them on board because they will help you with that regulation um, and they'll help persuade the government or persuade other uh, medical practitioners that this is the right way forward. So use your friends, you know, and I think that that's a really important thing, not to try to battle people, but to use your friends. And that's how it happened in Australia when we got independent practice. There was a lot of assistance uh, from um, our medical colleagues who we worked with. So I suppose just through mentoring, talking with people, running workshops on leadership, um, trying to um, get people to make sure that they listen to each other, they talk with each other. They're all the fundamental things of um, being able to move forward, whether it's a physiotherapy association, whether it's a school of physiotherapy or a university like you are, it's that dialogue, the listening, listening to ideas and moving forward. And I must say that uh, it, it tends to go up and down a little bit. So sometimes it looks as if things have really moved forward and then all of a sudden, whoops, it goes down again. Um, but that's all right. That's part of life, um, the experiences and things. And I look now at the countries round about and there's terrific leadership in so many of our regional uh, area now. I mean, in Taiwan, fantastic leadership with Xu Fen there. There's terrific leadership in Malaysia, the Philippines, um, some great, and they've changed their practice of education and things there. And they've had terrific leadership there with Royson and uh, now with uh, Michael Parab there. And uh, Indonesia has just been fantastic as they've moved forward and gone on with their educational programs. Um, I've just recently been, um, assisting with uh, a friend of mine who's done a lot of work in Afghanistan. They've just finally got permission to move into the university sector. And so again, helping with curriculum development and things uh, as they try to write up their development. I had a wonderful time a couple of years ago. I went to Iran as a guest speaker at their conference. I couldn't have met a nicer group of people and people really pushing forward to um, get physiotherapy more strongly seen around health promotion and things. So when I go to places like that, sometimes they'll put me on a radio broadcast so that 
they've got someone from outside saying things on their behalf. Um, again, negotiating like that around uh, what it is to be a physiotherapist. What do others see it outside? How do you see it within your own countries? Um, so I suppose it's just a, with experience over time and things that it's been, um, as I say, I just, I'm so privileged um, to oh, have met you. and worked with the people that I have over the years. You're too modest to accept that. I think the two are very important message for an association, which I can hear it from you is, first is keep investing in your members and developing leadership in the second row always. Never forget that, that we have yeah. enough. Second yeah. thing is to navigating your, you know, way by the dialogue. So that's yeah. most important. And I think another aspect, what you touched very beautifully, I think we have to pick it from here that the main role of association is to set up standards. Yes. Not to start regulating. I think that's what, what we uh, want to do at Society of Indian Physiotherapy, set up certain things so that member can refer it to that. Yeah. And of course, developing leadership for the next time, it's actually uh, the most yeah. prime agenda for us. And yeah. Yeah. let me move forward. Uh, Jillian, you have been part of Society of Indian Physiotherapists from inception and yeah. you haven't missed even a single conference so far. What happened this year? We've got COVID. <laughs> <laughs> we will be doing meeting up soon in Chennai. We have finalized the date almost yeah. like it's 8th, 9th and 10th of January in 22. So oh, we good. will be meeting physically and we'll send you the details the moment it's signed up. What I wanted to ask you is you have been watching and being part of activities what SIP has been involved, Society of Indian Physiotherapists. So what is your thought about this and what is your idea and how we can improve further, how we can make it better and make some impact on our members? Oh, look, I think there's a number of things that you do really well. Um, I think your conferences have come along um, and I'm particularly um, delighted that the focus is around research and young researchers coming along, being able to present their research information, whether it's by a poster or whether it's a podium presentation, but that's so important for young physiotherapists. <clears throat> And you've had some good other speakers who can mentor them and they can make relationships and connections with, which is fantastic because it's our young people we have to be working with. Uh, they're the ones, they're the future. And we've got to, I, I think that SIP, the Society of Indian Physios has been fantastic because you've got such senior people there who have all really keen to try and bring the next generation along round education, round research, and therefore round practice. <clears throat> and I think that that's a really important thing that you've done there to mentor to that. I think the other thing that you've been doing is been doing your health days um, where you've been out in communities and things. I suppose the issue for you all, as it is with any society and things, is how do you keep momentum going? because you're all volunteers and you've all got jobs and busy jobs and things, and that's always difficult. So it's trying to reach out to get some of the next generation um, who are interested and keen and get them to come along and sit on meetings, sit in, uh, make sure they're included, um, <clears throat> perhaps run some, you know, leadership programs for middle level physiotherapists or something so that they can see a way forward in um, how they can help move the profession forward in, in India. So I see SIP having a very special role in doing things like that. You're a small group of people, you've grown a bit, that's good. Never intended to become a huge entity, which is also good. Working closely now with IAP, which is great, but I could see a role where you could do perhaps a bit more round mentoring of younger ones. Um, really getting people to nominate two or three people from a university or from a research institute or from a practice and putting in a, a leadership program um, that would get people from the different regions of India talking together, thinking about the future, thinking about how they move forward in the association and things. So I think for me, that's how I see the Society of Indian Physiotherapists. It's very much around that uh, influences, if you like. You can be the influences um, because you've all had such a lot of experience. And then I think that helps bring 
the next group. So it's good to see people like Nara Seaman there and, uh, you know, different ones coming along and we need to get that next lot and then those ones need to get the next lot along. But it, I, I do think that um, some sort of leadership program coming out of SIP would be fantastic. Um, and just, we... you could nominate, have, you know, X number of nominations from different areas or whatever. And because of things like Zoom and we've all got so used to Zoom and things, there's many ways in which you can run leadership programs and uh, give people the confidence and the, um, the knowledge and skills how to take a leadership role in, a, in an appropriate manner. Yeah. No, I think I agree. We have been blessed with having a patronage <coughs> of senior members like Dr. Bela Sethi, mm -hmm. Dr. Yeah. Dastur, Saroj Ben Sangvi from Mumbai, yeah. Savita Ma'am, and Dr. Yeah. Raju Parashar are on our governing body. So I think we have been very lucky, apart from several others who are very senior and have done their work not only at in the national but also at the international arena so yeah. very happy but having said that i think it's very important that we reinvest in our next generation of leaders yeah. so Thanks. i think the idea very well taken that we should be involving ourselves in developing that second level yeah. of leadership yeah. i think it's a time that we should be looking at yeah. but you know i'll take you back to uh, the international again arena once the word physiotherapy has been going through a lot of changing right yeah. from the name to working style regulation a lot of vibrancy which has come which we see in day-to-day -day functioning how do you see that oh look i think it's fantastic it's really good to see uh, one i think changing your brand name is a good idea. Uh, a confederation is a bit of an old hat term, I suppose. So world physiotherapy is succinct and it, it, it describes us beautifully. Um, I think that uh, strengthening up um, the executive office in London has been really good and uh, building up their competencies and people who have been working there. And now one of the things that we've been hoping for a long time is that we're getting central support from um, uh, the office in London to support AWP, which is fantastic. So Rachel Moore is going to be our sort of support person from uh, World Physiotherapy. And that's terrific, because that's something we've talked about for a long time, about how do you get a continuum going, if you like, because uh, in all of the um, committees and things there's changeovers all the time and for a long time the Australian Physiotherapy Association supported the region by having a secretariat there who did the work and uh, that was fantastic but then it caused some problems for us because of the tax problems etc but it, it, it's difficult having bank accounts in Australia or a bank account in Taiwan or a bank account here and who manages it and then it has to change when the committee changes. So now we've got this more centralised system that will assist out into the region and I think that's fantastic. And in the region there's been some good things going on where um, World Physiotherapy might have got a grant of money that they then work with one of the countries in the region or work with the region. So they've done a terrific work in Vietnam to get them on board as a member of uh, World Physiotherapy. Uh, they've worked hard with um, doing a paediatrics program that Sufen has, been, Sufen has been able to run and get people from the region. And I know in Africa particularly, they had had some funding to help develop and set up associations and things. So that idea of using world physiotherapy and the uh, central body then working out into the regions working with either countries or with the executive of the region or working with people in the region I think is a fantastic way of going forward so it gives strength both centrally but it also gives strength outside to the regions yeah so I think it boats where they are actually consolidated their resources also and empowering yeah. the members as well. So I think great to see that. And I see yeah. uh, a lot of future and for the and I also agree that Jonathan Kruger is also taking forward the legacy started by Brenna Mayers and doing an excellent job again as she used to do that. Yeah. And great. So now uh, let me also ask you, give us some idea about the current AWP structure, how it's functioning. So, as I said, we've been very active during COVID time with having uh, a messenger um, set up, which has been, it's been fantastic because everybody really 
would almost daily send in how they were going with COVID or ask questions about how physio was going or get some expertise and people would send links to where they could find out other things. So from that point of view, it's been fantastic. Um, we've got a meeting coming up pretty soon in um, uh, Hong Kong. So it's a virtual meeting, of course. Uh, we were supposed to be meeting there with their Hong Kong Associations conference, but of course everything's gone virtual. So, no, and then of course there's the meeting in Dubai. So again, there's these meetings that come up regularly. Um, I think that yes, it, I, I think that it will work even better now having Rachel working with us and having World Physio really backing up the region a bit more so that we can do different sorts of activities uh, within the region with different groups and things. So being able to help Afghanistan get their curriculum sorted out and yet going to Afghanistan is not the easiest thing in the world for most people. Absolutely. So being able to help there is a really important issue. To be able to help other countries who are looking to try and get um, independent practice, you know, being able to get some people in from the region or from centrally to be able to talk with government, to be able to talk with different bodies and things. I think that's been strengthened up on things. So I think there's a lot going on. Um, and uh, it's good to see what we need now is to get again, like I was saying about India, we need to get the next generation of leaders coming along as well. We need to be getting uh, people from some of the different countries onto executive. And again, that's about leadership training and governance training. Um, and of course, there are some issues because uh, it's quite costly um, if you know so for someone coming say from Sri Lanka to be on the executive uh, yes the we can cover some costs and things but there's always costs there's time costs so often the people who come on to executive are busy in their own association as well as uh, going on to a regional one. So I think we've still got to keep working about how we bring that next generation. And I, I would love to see like, a, if you like, almost a, you've got your executive board and then you've got your junior executive who are working alongside or with being mentored and things who might be from some different countries and can be mentored into the position or something Getting like that. Simultaneously. Yeah, so that you're sort of doing a shadowing of uh, positions, a shadowing of what goes on. Um, because the regions can do a certain amount, but we, you know, if you want to get funding to do things, it's easier working with, certainly better to work with World Physiotherapy and look for funding so that an association might be able to work here and help or another association can work here and help. Um, so I think that those sorts of things are building up. And I think for the region, again, leadership, leadership and leadership, you know, I think, um, and that's something, of course, for India as well, you know, getting that next generation of, of leaders coming through so that you don't get into the situation you got into before. Yeah. Completely can't agree more than what you said just now. I think the most important aspect they developed the second line was ready to take up your ideas forward. Otherwise, it will all dry at that so yeah. whenever there is a change. So yeah. thank you so much, Julian. It's always a pleasure and delight talking to you, discussing so many aspects. I have so many questions. I wanted to touch about Asian <laughs> Confederation of Physical Therapy, but I think the paucity of time may not allow. So maybe if I can quickly ask you, if you can tell us something about, we also have a group within Asia, it's called Asian Confederation of Physical Therapy. So I, I mean, what, what is that according to you? I mean, I'm not very sure about that. Oh, well, they uh, started before AWP, so there uh, were a group that started, I think, from Japan, Tam, Indonesia, Korea. Uh, they're a network, um, and they uh, all belong to um, World Physiotherapy as well. Um, they have they run conferences, and um, I go along to their conferences, and you know. Uh, it's like anything, we need to communicate. 
Uh, we're not separate beings. Uh, they're just a group who started and they're a strong group of friendships as well as a strong group of um, support to each other in the region. Uh, you could see, I've been trying for quite a while, you could see something similar set up, say, through um, uh, the subcontinent. The countries in the subcontinent, through, you've got a, the, uh, what is it, SARC. I would love to see you use SARC to sort of set up a, a group within the subcontinent that shares ideas together, that shares resources and people together, because I was going to say you speak the same language. Well, I don't literally mean that, although a lot of you do, uh, but it's it's a natural get together, if you like, of people with common yeah, yeah. Yeah. commonality and things. And I would love to see a group formed from SARC um, that could share standards of education, standards of regulation. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all the subcontinent countries had the same sort of standards? Yeah, absolutely, it would be absolutely. It would, uh, if I could do something like that, I could die happy because I think it would be fantastic to have that and, yeah. and would make ease of working between countries and things so much better if we get the standards right and things. So the network, um, yes, they're, you know, they're a great group of people. They work hard and they have a conference and they just rotate the conference um, and that country takes the costs of it and then it rotates to another country. Um, there's no, they don't pay to belong to it and things, but they all belong to uh, World Physiotherapy. And I certainly, when I was chair of the region, made it very clear that you, the best way is not to have a fight with anybody, but to talk and to collaborate. And uh, we've run AWP conferences alongside their conferences. So, you know, it's got together and things. It just happens to be another group that get together a group of it's expanded a bit but it is probably similar sort of backgrounds too that's why i say the subcontinent would be another one um, we're a very dis diverse and dispersed um, region if you start because we start in the middle east of course so there's another grouping up there uh, <clears throat> we've got the large indo-chinese background sort of groups and then we've got the subcontinent and then we've got the pacific islands so you know we've got uh, an australia and new zealand sort of paddling around down the bottom here so <clears throat> it's an interesting um region for its diversity and i don't see anything wrong with some other groups getting together as long as it doesn't divide us um, and that's the main thing so I come back to the same thing if we talk and listen to each other we don't divide we gain from each other and we learn from each other um, and I think that that is always the best way forward yeah absolutely actually that's what our motto also says that connect collaborate and innovate so we yeah. firmly believe in that and yeah. uh, we did did some sort of a uh, groundwork for that SARC idea in December last to last year, but unfortunately because of COVID, we did communicate with our SARC members and yeah. soon we might come up with some sort of a collaboration where at least yeah. the professional from SARC country can come together. Yeah. That may uh, happen soon, if not this year, but surely for the next year. We did do some kind of a, a groundwork for that. Absolutely. And thanks for, you know, kind of endorsing that idea again, which gives us more confidence to go and get it on that people and with these words, Gillian, thank you so much for uh, sparing and, you know, sparing your time, sharing your journey and experience. It's always a delight and a pleasure talking to you. There's so much of learning every time I speak to you. I remember meeting you for the first time in 2007 at, uh, I think, one of the WSP conference in Canada. You were the chair of International Society for Educators in Physiotherapy. And since then, it's been always a new learning experience, whatever time I get to speak to you. So thank you so much. I know it's almost midnight. Thank you so very much. In the last, before we sign up, can I request you if you have any message for young physiotherapists who is watching you today or may watch you later from India, you want to share with them, we would be happy to have that. Be passionate. 
be passionate about what you do, whether it's physiotherapy or whatever else you do, be passionate about it. Um, I'm as passionate about physiotherapy now as when I graduate. In fact, probably more passionate about it because I see what an enormous role we've got to play in our communities, particularly with the uh, non-communicable diseases, the chronic diseases. We have such an enormous role to play. Just be passionate about it. Join into things, be part of things. Take leadership roles, even if it's only for 10 people or five people, be a leader. Everyone can be a leader and everyone can help develop the profession. But it's not about so much about developing the profession, but about ensuring that our communities get the best physiotherapy services possible and enjoy it and be passionate about it. So that's what I'd say to you young people, really find the niche you, you can in physiotherapy or if it's not in physio and you go off and do medicine or you go off and do law, be passionate about it and be passionate about the people that you work with because that's what makes us good therapists, makes us good citizens, if you like. So um, that's what I would say to people, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jillian, for your word of wisdom and look forward to see you in Chennai soon in yep. January 2022. And we yes. sure will keep getting your guidance, blessings yep. and your expertise in developing society of Indian physiotherapists in particular and physiotherapy in India at last. So thank you so much the way you are. And we look forward to keep seeing you again and again. Yeah. Thank you so very much. No, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Nice it's been wonderful and everyone who's watching or has been listening I miss you all terribly and I'm really looking forward to this blessed pandemic finishing so that we can get together again so again thanks very very much for inviting me